To begin, then, here is a scene in which I am the man and my friend Sarah Cole is the woman. I don't mind describing it now because I'm a decade older and don't look the same now as I did then, and Sarah Cole is dead. That is to say, on hearing this story, you might think me vain if I looked the same now as I did then, because I must tell you that I was extremely handsome then. And if Sarah were not dead, you'd think I was cruel, for I must tell you that Sarah was very homely. In fact, she was the homeliest woman I have ever known. And I knew her well, because for three and a half months we were lovers. Here is the scene. You can put it in the present, even though it took place ten years ago, because nothing that matters to the story depends on when it took place. And you can put it in Concord, New Hampshire, even though that is indeed where it took place, because it doesn't matter where it took place. So it might as well be Concord, New Hampshire, a place I happen to know well and can therefore describe with sufficient detail to make the story believable. Around six o'clock on a Wednesday evening in late May, a man enters a bar. The bar, a cocktail lounge at street level, with a restaurant upstairs, is decorated with hanging plants and unfinished wood paneling, butcher block tables and captain's chairs, with a half dozen darkened, thickly upholstered booths along one wall. Three or four men between the ages of twenty-five and thirty-five are drinking at the bar, and like the man who has just entered, wear three-piece suits and loosened neckties. They are probably lawyers, young, unmarried lawyers, gossiping with their brethren over martinis so as to postpone arriving home alone at their whitewashed townhouse apartments where they will fix their evening meals in microwave ovens and afterwards, while their TVs chuckle quietly in front of them, sit on their couches and do a little extra work for tomorrow. They are, for the most part, honorable, educated, hard-working, shallow, and moderately unhappy young men. Our man, call him Ronald, Ron, in most ways is like these men, except that he is unusually good-looking, and that makes him a little less unhappy than they. Ron is effortlessly attractive, a genetic wonder, tall, slender, symmetrical, and clean. He is beautiful the way we usually think of a woman as being beautiful. And he is nice, too the consequence, perhaps, of his seeming not to know how beautiful he is to men as well as women, to young people, even children, as well as old, to attractive people who realize immediately that he is so much more attractive than they as not to be competitive with them, as well as unattractive people. Ron takes a seat at the bar, unfolds the evening paper in front of him, and before he can start reading, the bartender asks to help him, calling him Sir, even though Ron has come into this bar numerous times at this time of day, especially since his divorce last fall. Ron got divorced because after three years of marriage, his wife chose to pursue the career that his had interrupted, that of a fashion designer, which required her to live in New York City, while he had to continue to live in New Hampshire, where his career got its start. They agreed to live apart until he could continue his career near New York City, but after a few months, between conjugal visits, he started sleeping with other women, and she started sleeping with other men, and that was that. No big deal, he explained to friends, who liked both Ron and his wife, even though he was slightly more beautiful than she. We really were too young when we got married, college sweethearts. But we're still best friends, he assured them. They understood. Most of Ron's friends were divorced by then, too. Ron orders a scotch and soda with a twist and goes back to reading his paper. He lights a cigarette. He goes on reading. He takes a second sip of his drink. Everyone in the room, the three or four men scattered along the bar, the tall, thin bartender, and several people in the booths in back, watches him do these ordinary things. He has got to the classified section, is perhaps searching for someone willing to come in once a week and clean his apartment, when the woman who will turn out to be Sarah Cole leaves a booth in the back and approaches him. She comes up from the side and sits next to him. She's wearing heavy tan cowboy boots and a dark brown suede cowboy hat, lumpy jeans, and a yellow T-shirt that clings to her arms, breasts, and round belly like the skin of a sausage though he will later learn that she is thirty-eight years old, 
She looks older by about ten years, which makes her look about twenty years older than he actually is. It's not bad here at the bar, she says, looking around. More light, anyhow. What you reading? she asks, brightly, planting both elbows on the bar. Ron looks up from his paper with a slight smile on his lips, sees the face of a woman homelier than any he has ever seen or imagined before, and goes on smiling lightly. He feels himself falling into her tiny, slightly crossed, dark brown eyes, pulls himself back, and studies for a few seconds her mottled, pocked complexion, bulbous nose, loose mouth, twisted and gapped teeth, and heavy but receding chin. He casts a glance over her thatch of dun-colored hair and along her neck and throat where acne burns against gray skin and returns to her eyes and again feels himself falling into her. What did you say? he asks. She knocks a mentholated cigarette from her pack and Ron swiftly lights it. Blowing smoke from her large wing-shaped nostrils, she speaks again. Her voice is thick and nasal, a chocolate-colored voice. I asked you what you're reading, but I can see now. She belts out a single loud laugh. The paper. Ron laughs, too. The paper. The conquered monitor. He is not hallucinating. He clearly sees what is before him and admits, no, he asserts to himself that he is speaking to the most unattractive woman he has ever seen, a fact that fascinates him, as if instead he were speaking to the most beautiful woman he has ever seen. So he treasures the moment, attempts to hold it as if it were a golden ball, a disproportionately heavy object which, if he does not hold it lightly, with precision and firmness, will slip from his hand and roll across the lawn to the lip of the well and down, down to the bottom of the well, lost to him forever. To keep this moment here before him, he begins to ask questions of her. He buys her a drink, he smiles, until it seems even to him that he is taking her and her life, its vicissitudes and woe, quite seriously. He learns her name, of course, and she volunteers the information that she spoke to him on a dare from one of the two women sitting in the booth behind her. She turns on her stool and smiles brazenly, triumphantly to her friends, two women also homely, though nowhere as homely as she, and dressed like her in cowboy boots, hats, and jeans. One of the women, a blonde with an underslung jaw and wearing heavy eye makeup, flips a little wave at her, and as if embarrassed, she and the other woman at the booth turn back to their drinks and sip fiercely at straws. Sarah returns to Ron and goes on telling him what he wants to know, about her job at Rumford Press, about her divorced husband, who was a bastard and stupid and sick, she says, as if filling suddenly with sympathy for the man. She tells Ron about her three children, the youngest a girl in junior high school and boy crazy, the other two boys in high school and almost never at home anymore. She speaks of her children with genuine tenderness and concern, and Ron is touched. He can see with what pleasure and pain she speaks of her children. He watches her tiny eyes light up and water over when he asks their names. You're a nice woman he informs her. She smiles, looks at her empty glass. No, no, I'm not. But you're a nice man to tell me that. Ron, with a gesture, asks the bartender to refill Sarah's glass. She is drinking white Russians. She asks him about himself, his job, his divorce, how long he has lived in Concord, but he finds that he is not at all interested in telling her about himself. He wants to know about her even though what she has to tell him about herself is predictable and ordinary, and the way she tells it unadorned and cliched. He wonders about her husband. What kind of man would fall in love with Sarah Cole? 